Lee, and my driving question was, can I tell the class about the belts of Taekwondo and what are some benefits of Taekwondo? The reason why I chose this topic is because I do Taekwondo. Here is the belt that I'm on and what the belt means. Red Black Belt. <clears throat> the dawn of a new day. The sun breaks through the darkness. The previous day has ended giving way to a new dawn. The student must begin a new phase of training, that of being a black belt. The red is the sun in a sunrise as it breaks through the black of night. I hope to achieve my black belt by next year. And here <laughs> is a video of me doing Taekwondo and Emmy in sparring. work and determination. Not only do I do Taekwondo, but Ryan who has Down Syndrome can do it too. He trains at my Taekwondo studio. Here is a video of him getting his black belt. And you will see my master Sam. Ryan Bailey isn't only breaking fours. He's breaking boundaries. At 14 years old, he's earned his first degree black belt in Taekwondo. Everybody is different. That's why martial arts are so special. Because each kid can come in to have so we need, we need coach people to do is just do what you can, the best you can, and don't worry about the, the thing that you can do, just try to do the things that you can do. Olivia, and my driving question is, can I train my dog as if he were trained by a dog trainer? This is my dog, Zeb. Please don't ask how he got his name. I don't know. He, Zeb is going to do a few tricks for us today, but first, here are a couple fun facts. In training some dogs, they have to do multiple jobs. Dogs that are trained for fun can work just as well as military dogs. Service dogs have a task like protect or help people that are in need or disabled, but they have to be highly trained to do that. About 7,500 dogs are trained a year to help people. A German Shepherd is one of the most easily learning dogs. Most big dogs learn faster than small dogs. <laughs> the run between a human and its dog is unbelievable. Each year, more than 425 dogs are trained for service. Now, I'm going to teach you how to teach a dog to sit. To teach a dog to sit, you hold the tree over their head with, with the dog standing, and the dog will sit like that. <laughs> to teach a dog to lay down. To teach a dog to lay down, you get the tree, and then you pull the treat down like that, and then the dog will follow its head with the treat. How to teach a dog to be shy. To teach your dog to be shy, you would get a piece of tape and lightly place it on its head, like you wouldn't press it hard, and then the dog would try and scratch it off and, and then reward him with a treat after he does that. Quick fun fact. Anytime you try and tra teach a dog, you always need to reward them with a treat. FYI, that helps them learn faster. <laughs> How to teach a dog to come here. <laughs> if you're... Oh, bless you. Thank you. 
Get your head down. Like that. Lay down. Caucasian Shepherds. Caucasian Shepherds are good protecting dogs, but can also be very violent when they are protecting their owners. <coughs> My last dog is a Rottweiler. Rottweilers are dangerous, dangerous dogs, but good protecting dogs and a little fun fact they are very good at jumping. gotten the bad rip, but of course they are mean. They, have, they haven't been treated the right way. If they are treated with love, they can be like any other dog. That concludes my presentation. Hi, I'm Bailey Watson, and my driving question is, what are the pros and cons of traffic hunting? Poaching. <laughs> Is illegally hunt or catch game on land that is not one's own or isn't under any official service. Trophy hunting is hunting wild game for human recreation. And I showed you that because it will be said a lot throughout my presentation. Here are three pros for trophy hunting. One pro is it helps get rid of rogue animals, like if it cannot mate and it is killing other animals. Two, you have to pay lots of money, and that helps wildlife pro conservationists make home for almost extinct animals. They pay for the guards and the vehicles they patrol the outside of a conservation group and look out for poachers. To almost extinct animals. Without trophy hunting, they might have thousands more extinct species. Cons of trophy hunting. It might ruin your life, your career, and your relationships. So watch what you are doing. You are doing good things and tell why it's right. You will be spending lots of money and you might go bankrupt. Killing rhinos, lions, elephants, hippos, and other vulnerable and endangered animals will actually help protect the species. What? <laughs> Thank you. 
Howdy humans, Trace here for DNews. In 2011, GoDaddy CEO Bob Parsons was the target. Last year, it was newscaster <coughs> Melissa Bachman, and this year, it's Texas cheerleader Kendall <coughs> Jones. Hunters killing big game are attacked every year online, and with good reason. It's difficult to wrap our collective heads around the killing of endangered animals. Over 61,000 people as of Tuesday have signed a petition to remove Miss Jones' Facebook page, claiming it's encouraging animal abuse. But in the end, hunters and conservationists aren't really at odds. They're like frenemies. Modern conservation is an expensive business. Reserves must be maintained, policed, and the animals protected. Governments have to be lobbied to create discouragingly high penalties for poaching, and then enforce those poaching laws. We're not even talking about the millions of dollars spent on conservation educational campaigns. When pictures like this hit the internet, people freak out. But hunters claim by taking a few trophies, they're actually helping to keep conservation alive. Hi, my name is Brenner, and my dragon question is, why is the Leaning Tower of Pisa leaning, and what prevents it from falling? The Leaning Tower of Pisa had started to lean because the workers did not line them up, causing it to lean. The Leaning Tower of Pisa came into history at 1173, so it has been leaning for almost 900 years. The tower was started in 1173 and had ended in 1399. The cause of this is that there had been many uh, wars before they could finish it. But it is actually not leaning, it's actually falling. Every year it falls one or two millimeters per year. So one day, eventually, the Leaning Tower of Pisa will fall and get demolished. Five degree angle, the Leaning Tower of Pisa is lucky it didn't end up as a pile of rubble. So why does the Leaning Tower lean? Well, the original foundations were just 20 meters squared by three meters deep and set on soft marshy ground, not ideal for 14.5 tons of marble on top. The experts then realized they needed to get engineers to create a more permanent solution. Now, the outer wall and the inner wall of the tower are made of marble, but in between those is a cavity filled with rubble. So the engineers inject that concludes my presentation. Hi, I'm Kelsey, and my driving question is how to help a local animal shelter. There's many ways to help an animal shelter. The main reason is to adopt. You can foster, donate blankets, toys, food, and beds and bowls to help them take care of the animals in the shelter. The point about my presentation my question is how to keep animals from getting put to sleep because this happens way too often. The reason for that is because people are not getting their animals fixed. The reason I did this subject is because my mom and dad for my 12th birthday adopted a Yorkie from the shelter for me to help and they help the shelter by adopting a dog so the shelter has less dogs. I love animals, period. It doesn't matter how it looks, I still love them. The main reason I did this because the shelter, because I watch Hope for Paul's YouTube channel sometimes and I see them save animals and people donating, fostering, and adopting animals. I have a video I'd like to show from Hope for Paul's rescuing a precious homeless dog named Pax. I also have a great website that shows how we can best help a local animal shelter.
as you can see from my website and pres uh, from my presentation, the website and and organizations like Hope for Paul's or like the Rescue, we are donating to in Miss Labrie's class. You can forever change the life of animals in need. I hope I encourage you to adopt, not shop for animals, and to give our to give to our local animal shelter because you can be a difference maker in the lives of long forgotten and unloved pets. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Grace, and my driving question is what do you need to know to be a marine biologist? Marine biology is a scientific study of marine life, organisms in the sea, and sometimes training them. Marine biologists also protect marine animals. To be a marine biologist, you need a keen interest in research, excellent oral and written communication skills, a logical approach to problem solving, good observation skills, and the ability to swim. Uh, the ability to swim and work independently or part of a team. Most marine biologists spend part of their time researching and the other part working in environments like marshes, wetlands, and oceans. They only study things in fresh and salt water. When you're a marine biologist, you study the majority of an animals because 50 to 80 percent of animals live in the sea. Different groups of sea animals are pods, dolphin, beds, eel, and oyster, schools of fish, leather, jellyfish, and a bind, salmon. Marine biologists often travel to beautiful places to study the small things like plankton to the large things like whales. Equipment marine biologists use is boats, water samplers, lab equipment, nets, com nets and computers. To become a marine biologist, you should study pre-calculus, chemistry, physics, and of course, biology. Some good colleges that offer marine biology are Boston University, University of Maine, University of Hawaii, and University of North Carolina. It takes about four to six years of college to become a marine biologist. Some of the different math they use is Calculus 1, Calculus 2, Algebra, and Trigonometry. There are few numbers of marine biologists and dolphin trainers needed, so it would be hard to get this job. But if you truly want to do this, there are two routes you could go. You could either become a biology major in college, or you could become a marine vet first. Then when you learn more about marine bi life, become a marine biologist. Disadvantages of being a marine biologist are hurricanes, tsunamis, and rough waves. But if you're usually curious and love the outdoors, especially the ocean, this would be a great job for you. We do lots of training sessions, lots of husbandry work with the dolphins, so we're constantly trying to look after their health. We're also trying to enrich their lives, so lots of play sessions. We also do a few interactive programs, so introducing people to dolphins and of course a couple of shows as well. Every dolphin has their own little personality, they're all a little bit different, and they're a lot of fun getting to know them and also to train them as well. And that concludes my presentation. Hi, my name is Alex, and the reason I wanted to do the Taj Mahal is because I've always wanted to be to one of the seven wonders, so I looked up one of them and I saw the Taj Mahal for my first one. So I started doing it, and when I started researching on the Taj Mahal, I noticed that it said that it started to sink. What is the Taj Mahal? The Taj Mahal is a mausoleum. It's like a tomb for a special person or people. It was commissioned in 1632 by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan John, in memory of his wife that died. It was completed in 1643. One, one of the problems was believed that the Taj Mahal is sinking. There's many different reasons why. So why it could, so my presentation will be over the reasons. The base. They dug hundreds of wells, each more than 40 feet deep, then they filled them with gravel. They reinforced them with wooden wheels, so possibly the polluted river water could be eroding them. Tourists. A lot of people come to the Taj Mahal to praise the memory of Shah Jahan, but some people chip away with keys and knives. I think they do it because they are precious jewels embedded in the marble. Poor structure. Lentils, sugar candy, and quesadilla were the only thing combined to make mortar. Lentils is a food that everyone eats, and also sugar candy, which is sticky, and the quesadilla, which is a, has adhesive properties. Uh, adhesive is a stuff like oil. The structure was not made by a machine, but instead 20,000 workers with hammers and chisels.
but soon changed by Professor Alfred P. Halsted. The first game was played in 1896 at Cecil College. Some wonder how much volleyball players make. Volleyball player Gabrielle Reese makes $1.8 million for her annual salary. The first Olympic volleyball game was at Tokyo in the year 1964. The team consisted of six girls. The Japanese women won the first tournament. Volleyball, volleyball positions are outside hitter, middle hitter slash blocker, libero, setter, middle bat, and defense specialist. What does it take to become an Olympic volleyball player? Excellent stamina, strong legs, and a high vertical jump, mainly if you want to be a hitter. Good pivoting skills and quickness. Good communication skills, good ball control, strong arms, and motivation and a can-do attitude. Fun fact about volleyball. Sanford University has the best women's college volleyball team. Most volleyball players jump about 300 times a match. The longest recorded volleyball game was in the Netherlands for 85 hours. Volleyball is the second most popular sport in the world today, exceeded only by soccer. The top professional men's volleyball players earn around $1 million US dollars per year at their clubs. This is a video of one of the longest rallies ever. <laughs> Another chance for Katie Stack. Poulter tries to go to the back corner, but Albright was there. And then Becky with another swing. Connor dies and puts it over. The rally will continue. Burks into the block. Roll shot from Jocelyn Burks. Becky tries to end the rally. Donnelly to dig. Again, Donnelly dies for that ball, keeps it in play. Longest rally we've seen so far. Hunter out to Becky. Static into the block. Play continues. Donnelly saves it. Will this rally end? Who's going to take it? Hunter the back set. Rolfson puts it over. goes for her own attack, but Burks was ready. Becky, big swing from her, and the Ohio have the point of the attack here. Wow. Okay. Okay. At first, I wanted to do something simple for my, for my genius hour, and I wasn't too interested in the topic I had chosen. Then, out of nowhere, my parents decided they wanted to do adopt a puppy an hour before my basketball game. Of course, I fell in love with him. I named him Gunner, and he quickly became my best friend. That night, I watched a video on America's Got Talent, and it was this girl named Sarah training her dog, Hero. And I looked at the gun. I looked at Gunner. Then I looked back at the video and said to myself, "This is going to be my genius hour. Can I teach my dog tricks, and how do I do it?" Well, Gunner is only five months old, he is half lab, half boxer mix, and you have to admit, he's super duper cute. At first, I wanted to learn what the easiest dogs were to train, and the results were pretty shocking in my opinion. The top eight are Poodle, Golden Retriever, Lab, Collie, German Shepherd, Papa Loon, Cardigan Walsh Cordy, and Primbrook Walsh Cordy. I also wanted to learn what the relationship between dog and its owner came along. The phrase, man's best friend, came about when wolves would scavenge alongside people more than 33,000 years ago in Southeast Asia. Dogs went from wolves hunting alongside people to becoming common furry household pests 20, 26,000 years later. They have been used in war since six, 600 BC. When, the first, when they first started being used in war, they used to break up enemy, enemy formations and for charging into ranks, ranks, tearing up as many soldiers as possible. And the, then, in the 1900s, they had 10 specific jobs, and they were gun pulling, attacking, Red Cross or ambulance dogs, improved explosive device or IED, 
Anti-tank, which is when they go under tanks and blow them up. Sentinary or guard dogs. Para, which is when they parachute out of a plane. Scout, is which they sniff out weapon stores. Black Ops and mascot dogs are also used as service to help people who are injured, emotionally or physically unstable. Or they can be used as show dogs, which I am doing with my dog since I am teaching him tricks. My goals were to teach him how to sit, lay down, and roll over. I know it's not many, but it's a start for such a young dog. So I came up with simple hand motion for each tri trick and watched videos from the YouTube channel American Kennel Club to know how to teach him these tricks. So here's a short video of Gunner and I's final call. As you can see, I'm not a professional Good. dog trainer or anything, but here's a professional who I learned from, and I hope you will too, teaching a dog to roll over. Hi, I'm okay. Stephen McKay. I'm to go too fast, get the treat right to the dog's nose, and bring him into a down position. At that point, you can give up the treat, present the treat to him, let him have it. Then the next step is you want to roll him over on his side, and do this again by taking the treat, putting it right on his nose, and lifting his head so that his weight shifts onto his side. I know I'm not as good as him or anything, but this was a start to a great relationship between a dog and their owner. So that is how I taught my the best. I taught my dog how to do three simple tricks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate, and my driving question is, what are some types of therapies and techniques used by therapists? My inspiration for this occupation, it is a fact that 80% of people that go through therapy come out cured. Most people would think that's pretty good and that a lot of people are being cured. Now, that is true, but I think, what about the other 20%? I want to help all of them, even the 20%. My two aunts, Aunt Julian and Aunt Karis, do therapy stuff, and I've talked to my Aunt Julie about her job, and I found the topic very interesting. I knew that this could end up being a future career for me, which brings me to my next topic of what therapists use and how they use them. So my first topic I will share is diffusers. I actually have a diffuser with me, and you put oils in them, and the oil in it right now is orange citrus, if you can't already smell it. This is my diffuser, and each diffuser has different shapes, settings, lighting features. So mine has different lighting. That one's a color change. If you press it again, it stays on that color. And another one's a candlelight setting that works good in the dark. Okay, so now on my slide it says, therapists use diffusers because of the oil that goes in them. Each oil does different things, which you'll see in my next slide. Therapists are always using different things to make the environment more comfortable for the clients. Each person could need and or want a different oil. It just depends on what the person needs and what the oil does. Therapists use diffusers to lighten up the room and make it more comfortable, nice, and natural. Again, what makes diffusers so special is the essential oil in them. Oils go in diffusers, but you can use oils in lots of things. Like, you can also put them on your body as well. Now, here are six common oils and what they do. Peppermint makes you stay awake and helps with headaches. Lavender helps you fall asleep. Eucalyptus is used to ease cold symptoms and provide respiratory health benefits. Orange helps you when you are down. It's like a re-energizer. And then lemon makes you happy and lifts your spirits. Frankincense helps you stay relaxed and deals with depression. Now, the next thing I'll talk about is salt rock lamps. I have one with me, and it's just a miniature one. But therapists use salt rock lamps when in salt therapy, which is something used mainly in spas. And salt rock lamps are able to get rid of dust particles that may affect you. And now these are all the types of therapies, and they're not a few. They're not all of them, but here are a few main ones that I wanted to share. The first type of therapy is CPT, cognitive behavioral therapy. This is personally my favorite type of therapy because it deals with the brain and the thoughts. For example, a kid's parent left them. They think I'm not good. I'm not special enough. It's my fault, even when that's not true. Their, their mood is based off their thoughts, so in therapy session, they'll be told that's not their fault, they are special enough, and the parent just happened to leave, and that had nothing to do with them at all. So, they change the perspective on the situation. I think that's cool because I like to look at things in an optimistic angles, and I like to encourage others. 
Another example that might be more of our age group situation is you made a bad grade on a test and you think, I'm stupid, I'm a failure. When you're not, you just happen to make a bad grade on that particular test. Thank you, Kate! Hi, I'm Addison, and my driving question is, what does it take to be in the Air Force? I was interested in the Air Force because my grandpa was in the Air Force. In fact, I have his jacket on right here. My grandpa was in the Air Force for 15 years. He died at the age of 45 in, in the year of 2005 which you could probably guess that I wasn't born yet. Most people don't get to meet their heroes. I haven't met mine personally, but I feel like I have by my mom. This vision is for the Air Force, no other branch of military. I'm sure other branches of military have most of that process, but this branch I wanted to study because I would love to call my, one day call myself a member of the Air Force. I hope you learned something about the Air Force, and I hope you will enjoy. With the Air Force, you sign up or apply online, print the papers, go to basic training, which most of us you might know, but I am here to put, in, put it into a little more detail. First step, signing up. First, you will have to research the branch of military I'm doing the Air Force. Um, the second step is finding what, you, what you're interested in because you'll most likely have that job for two, four, or six years, whichever one you choose. Third step, career retainability. The Air Force has the best career retainability, it's 80%. Most branches of military have 20 to 30%. To keep career retainability up, you'll have to choose whether you want to stay in the Air Force for 20 years. Step four, contact your recruiter and travel to his office. Explain your situation, your intentions, your goals, and explain why you're interested in the Air Force and talk about the job and how long you would like to stay in the Air Force. ASVAP or ASVAP and MEPS. ASVAP stands for Armed, Serv Armed Service Vocational Altitude and MEPS stands for Military Entrance Processing Station. These are the tests you'll have to take. Step six, qualifications. Find out where you're qualified. You'll find out where you're qualified for on a test. If you have a disadvantage, you won't be qualified for certain jobs when you find out when you're where you're qualified for that list of jobs. Step seven: waiting period. If you apply after high school, your wait time will be shorter, and they will ship you out in a couple of months after graduation. If you're if you're not in high school, it will take a while. Step eight, stay qualified. Be smart, uh, be, be safe, illegal doings can get you kicked out immediately if you're in the Air Force, or it could prevent you from ever joining the military. Step nine, basic training. In conclusion, I have learned so much from Ms. LeBou letting us do Genius Hour. Now I am more inspired to go to the U.S. Air Force after I graduate high school. Thank you, Ms. LeBou. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something new about the U.S. Air Force. Hello, my name is Jonathan, and my driving question is, where does comedy originate from, and how has it changed over the years? The reason I got interested in this is just because I love like watching comedy movies on TV, and I just chose to do it over comedy. So where comedy originated from? 20 years ago, if you went to a comedy show, you might have little or no idea what or who you were seeing, unless it was a comic whose work you were familiar with. Starting from 425 BCE, Aristophanes, a comic playwright and satirical author of the ancient Greece theater, wrote 40 comedies, of 11 of which still survive. Aristophanes was a prolific and a much acclaimed comic playwright of ancient Greece, sometimes referred to as the father of comedy. Okay, here I have a video of Preacher Lawson. If you watch America's Got Talent, you know who he is. And then here it is. Enjoy. So 
So cool. About a year ago, uh, I went on a date and I got catfish. And I, it's when you meet someone online, then you meet them in person for real, and you're like, hey, that don't match. <laughs> you never mustache online, man, right? And so <laughs> I met this girl online. She was very pretty. She was super pretty. And I met her in person. She was just as pretty. That's not how she got me. All right? uh, the way she got me is when she walks kind of half a limp, which is cool. Like, I don't care if you get a limp when you walk. But, like, put in your profile somewhere. Like, ooh, I love long walks on the beach, but it's hard because my legs jacked up. You know, let me know. <laughs> but she didn't want anyone to know. And she's like, is that $10? Because it's mine now. <laughs> 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 then she became my girlfriend. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, guys. My name's Pretty Lot. I appreciate it. Here are some more facts about comedy. Some comedy is inappropriate, but also is not. It just depends on who you are watching. It's no secret that sometimes comedy is taken a bit too seriously. Comedy obsesses love, not just the jokes, but the mechanics and emotions of the comedy world. And these are pictures of famous comedians today. My favorite are these two right here, uh, Adam Sandler and Rob Schneider, because they always do movies together. And then it's just so funny. And then Kevin Hart, he's funny. He's funny too. He does a lot of movies too. I hope you enjoyed my presentation about comedy. Hi, my name is Jaden, and in my junior center topic is about the Bermuda Triangle. In my in my driving question for this for this topic is. Um, what are all the reasonings to the weird and mysterious disappearances at the Bermuda Triangle? The thing that made me interested in the Bermuda Triangle was actually the one <laughs> and the only, the, the woman that had the camera, Miss LeBou. Here are some facts about the Bermuda Triangle. The Bermuda Triangle is a place where people, ships, and airplanes have disappeared before. Amelia Earhart's airplane disappeared as she was passing by the Bermuda Triangle. And the thing is that made me like very curious as, ha as to how she had disappeared was that she was in the air and I still haven't solved that um, mystery. If you didn't know already, the Bermuda Triangle is also known as the Devil Triangle. As well, there are many different names for the Bermuda Triangle. I was just naming that one because people get it mixed up with Devil's Den and Devil's Triangle and they're two different topics. The Bermuda Triangle is a very scary place in my mind anyways it is because like who wouldn't want to like just disappear out, out of nowhere and not see their family until they actually have to pass away, you know? Now I will share my video with you. Large area in the Atlantic Ocean between Florida, Puerto Rico, and Bermuda. This region is notorious for its mysterious phenomena. Huge amounts of ships and planes have disappeared here. Its second name is the Devil's Triangle. All those mythical banishings happened under unknown and unexplained circumstances. Some of the planes and ships have never been found. There have been many theories about why it all occurs in that area, starting from water spouts to aliens and even sea monsters. But those were only theories. Reports go back to 1945, when five American torpedo bombers and a plane that was sent out to find them all vanished without a trace. Since that day, another 75 aircraft and several hundred ships have been lost. The latest tragedy happened in 2015, when the cargo ship El Faro disappeared in this region. El Faro was a U.S. vessel traveling from Florida to Puerto Rico. It disappeared from the radars on the 1st of October, 2015, and was found wrecked on the bottom of the ocean on the 31st of October. Another big incident happened on the 20th of June, 2005, when the first Piper PA airplane disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle near Berry Island. There was only one pilot on board without any passengers. Neither plane has ever been found. My name is Sydney, and my driving question is, how does a dog become a therapy dog? This topic inspired me because Miss Gibbs has a dog named Penny. A good therapy dog has to be friendly, patient, confident, and gentle and at ease. There are all kinds of therapy dogs. Therapy dogs have to have special training to become a therapy dog. If you want your dog to become a therapy dog, you have to make sure your dog is calm and loves giving attention.
During the 1960s, the first formal research involving animal therapy began. Dr. Boris Levinson found that his dog had a positive effect on mentally impaired young patients. Specifically, he discovered that these patients are more comfortable and likely to socialize with dogs than other humans. It wasn't until Freud's findings were translated and published years after his death that Levinson's findings were considered valid. This shows the controversy surrounding the topic of formalized animal therapy and makes it even more impressive that today it is so extensive. What does a therapy dog do? Sometimes they provide much needed companionship and sit or lie quietly while being petted and talked to. Therapy dogs may work with disabled children or go to school so they can learn about dogs. They also might go to hospitals and help with patients. The first type of therapy dog is called an animal assisted therapy dog. These dogs assist physical and occupational therapists in meeting goals important to an individual's recovery. They help people in hospitals and are very important. The second type of therapy dog is the faculty therapy dog. These dogs primarily work in nursing homes and are often trained to help keep patients with Alzheimer's disease or other mental illness from getting into trouble. These dogs are important to helping people who are in nursing homes and people who are ill. The third type of therapy dog is the most common one, which is a therapeutic visitation dog. Those dogs are household pets whose owners take them to visit hospitals, nursing homes, rehabilitation centers. This is Honey. She is a therapy dog that visits nursing homes and visits the library so that kids can reach her. She is a very calm and easy to because my Tia Mariela, Tia is aunt in Spanish, is from Argentina, and I wanted to learn more about the country in which she lived. I learned that most people in Argentina love tango. What is tango? Tango is a type of dance that people in Argentina do. Also, I learned what a siesta is. A siesta is an afternoon nap, usually taken during the hottest time of day. Also, their dinner is a very small meal, and they usually drink a drink called mata. Mata is a caffeine-enriched fused drink that is made from that is made by steeping dried tea leaves in hot water and is served with a hollow metal straw. A lot of people carry it around all day. Speaking about carrying things around, transportation in big cities includes buses, trains, taxis, and motorbikes. Also, they really like their crops, including soybeans, cattle, wheat, sugarcane, and apples. And another thing people like in Argentina is soccer. Now, soccer isn't really a cool sport in Texas, but in Argentina, they love it. it the, and the best player on their team is Messi. Who is Messi? Messi? Messi is a famous soccer player that grew up in central Argentina and played there. He was 13, but before he was 13, he was in the Little League. He went to the doctor one day and was diagnosed with a growth hormone. But that didn't stop him from being a professional soccer player. Also, attractions, one cool one to go see is Mount Aconabla. It is the largest and highest mountain in Central America. Their country, instead of saying dollar, they say peso, just like Mexico. Also, food, they have lots of choices, such as in Panada, is, it is baked pastry with filling and Latin cultures. Lastly, their schools are little different systems like kindergarten, is Intel level one through five, primary level, six through eight, secondary level, and lastly, nine through 12, tertiary ter level. As I mentioned in Argentina, they, um, this is a video of, tank, of people doing tank.
concludes my presentation. Hi, my name is Danica. My driving question is, is athleticism genetic? I was interested in this because I'm considerably athletic and so are my parents. Therefore, I was wondering if my parents and sister and I just have a common interest in sports or my sister and I inherited it. After a lot of research, I figured out that athleticism is in fact genetic. Being good at a, but being good, at, but being athletic does not only have to be inherited. Being good at a sport can be natural, but becoming better is a learned behavior. And believe me when I say this, it takes lots of practice. From looking at my slide, I hope you will learn that if you're athletic, you can thank your parents. Additionally, you can also thank yourself for being determined and having the mental state that it takes to be a successful athlete. Examples of kids who inherited their parents' athletic ability. Now we all know LeBron James, but did you know that he has a son? Because when I started this project, I didn't. Actually, he has two sons. LeBron James Jr. is about to be 14 and is already making huge accomplishments in basketball. Even LeBron says his son is better than he was at his age. LeBron Jr. has already received scholarships from Duke, Kentucky, and more. LeBron James Jr. was playing in an AAU tournament down in Miami. His father was in the stands cheering him on. For the first time ever, LeBron Jr. attempted an in-game dunk. His dad was cheering him on in the stands. Here's a picture of him attempting to dunk for the first time in a game. Now for my next example is Vashti Cunningham. Her father is Randall Cunningham, a four-time Pro Bowl quarterback and competed in high jump. She is the youngest woman ever to win the high jump at the World Indoor Championships. She is also the youngest to qualify for the Olympic Games since 1980. On the side of the slide, there's a picture of her. Brett Boone is my third example. Brett Boone became the first ever third generation big leaguer in baseball history. He is a former major league baseball player. He played in the All-Star game three times, received the Gold Glove Award four times. The Gold Glove Award is an award handed out to players when, who had a superior fielding season. He has also received the Silver Slugger Award twice. The Silver Slugger Award is an award handed out annually to the best offensive players at each position. Brett Boone's grandpa, Ray Boone, dad, Bob Boone, and brother, Aaron Boone, were all also major league baseball players. Last but, or wait, Shia Johnson is my fourth example. She is now only 13 and has some big accomplishments. Shia has won AAU Junior Olympics 800 meter race two years in a row. She is also very good at soccer and even boxes with her dad who is an NFL star, Chad Johnson. When she was 12 years old, her time of two minutes and 14 seconds in the 800 meter race set a new AAU club nationals record and won the competition by almost a full second. I'm sure that even the fastest from our school couldn't beat her time. Here's a video to see just how good she actually is. Last but not least, me. I'm pretty athletic. My dad was really good at baseball. My mom played lots of sports and was pretty good at them too. Them both being athletic led to me and my sister inheriting their athletic ability. My sister played softball and she was really good. My sister made varsity her freshman year and all East Texas outfielder her sophomore, junior, and senior year. In this slide, you will see pictures of my dad playing sports and a newspaper article that states some accomplishments he made in high school. My dad tried out for Philadelphia Phillies and was very close to making it. Here are some pictures of me and my friend Elise in softball. As you can see, I'm already showing that I inherited my parents' athletic ability. All of these pictures are from the school year and last. Those examples prove my question to be positive because big athletes have kids that are pretty good at the sport they put their mind to and last. Those examples prove my question to be positive because big athletes have kids that are pretty good at the sport they put their mind to. I gave examples of my sister and I whose parents might not be big stars, but they're definitely even bigger stars or athletes to us. They are a huge inspiration and are our biggest fans. They are raising pretty athletic kids who now will thank their parents for the huge opportunities they have given us, such as our athletic abilities. Thanks for listening to me present my presentation. Hi, my name is Lainey, and my driving question is, what is the role to help special need adults? Before I begin, I want to encourage you to listen to listen close and closely to my presentation because I might have a little su a surprise for you. 
The reason why I picked this subject is because my mom does this as her job, and she inspires me to see what she does for a living and learn how to help them. And another reason why I picked this is because I go to her work sometimes. Here is some information. Nearly 70% of the special need adults live under their group home, and the other 30% is with their family. Some part of the role is to get the activities organized, but some still go to work or go to school. And another part of the job is to do paperwork or paper roll, and another job is to supervise. When I went to a work sometimes, there is a board where either you get up there, you don't get to go places, and if you don't, you go, you do. Now we may watch the video. My name is Brian Klinger. I'm a learning options instructor and I've been at OP for almost two years. As a learning options instructor, I help people learn skills to become independent and gain independent employment in their work lives as well as their personal lives. Today in class, we will work on preparing vegetables, cutting them, washing them, different food safety techniques, uh, washing dishes, cooking. Thank you, Thank you Lainey. Lainey. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Lane. And I'm Mallory, and today we're doing our presentation over our passion project. Um, our passion project is FFA. Let's get started. Our drive-in question is how has FFA changed over the years? FFA is a student-led organization where students can gain leadership skills as well as responsibility. You can study plants or try breeding an animal. You're, you can have up to six different types of animals. Cows, chickens, goats, rabbits, pigs, and lambs. Your goal is to have the biggest but healthiest animal in your class. Once you make the sale with your animal, you will try to get buyers to come and buy your animal from you. They will bid, and whenever the price is stopped, you can get people to add on to your sale price. However, if you do not make the sale, you will have to find a buyer to buy your animal, which might be at a lower price range. The most important thing is to not be too attached to your animal, which for most people, like me, is hard. Here are some fun facts about FFA that really show how it has changed. First is the official colors of FFA are national blue and corn gold, which were adopted in 1929. The FFA jacket was adopted as an official dress in 1933. More than 50,000 FFA jackets are manufactured each year. The motto for FFA is learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve. And lastly, the original National Future Farmers of America was organized in 1928 in Kansas City. Here is a timeline which again really shows how FFA has changed. In 1928, FFA was formed. Next, in 1935, New Farmers of America founded in Tuskegee, Alabama. In 1942, tons of FFA members had to leave to go to the war. And then in 1969, women were finally allowed to join and participate in FFA. And lastly, in 2011, the National FFA Alumni Association celebrated its 40th anniversary. Women who changed FFA. Anita Decker Wright. She helped in the fields and learned how to repair farm equipment. Next is Kathy Mallison. She taught agricultural education, advised farmers as a country extension agent, and operated a garden center. Bel Belinda Chasen. Chasen long several, several impressive accomplishments within the organization. Next is Carly and Lindo Kruger. She was humbled to be the first woman to receive the American Star Farmer Award. That aside, she believes that participating in FFA has helped her shape the way of her life. And Brianna Holbert. Holbert served as a chapter officer, section officer, and chapter president. In 2017, she became the first African American woman to serve as the president of the National FFA Organization. Here we have energy with you FFA members. The first question is, what did it feel like when you first started FFA? Well, I was, uh, I don't know, I was excited. 
about it. It was kind of an extension of 4-H. What animal did you do on your first time? Um, I started out with, um, we raised polar herd cattle. Okay. Anyway. How old were you when you first started in the thing? Um, well, now we're old yarn, uh, 13, 14. What did it feel like when you first started in Well, I was really excited. And then what did you do? I did chicken. Which animal do you plan to do next year? Chickens, because I don't want to do bunnies, because I'll probably get attached to them. My sister is doing, showing her nose. Can you see it? <laughs> Hi, my name is Addison, and I chose, in my driving question is what is the history of a TV? I chose this topic because I've always been amazed at the history behind a TV and wanted to learn more about it. After many people have worked on and improved the television, the first TV was invented on March 25th, 1925. The first TV was invented wait, when TV first came out, only a few thousand Americans had one. It was one of those things that only rich people had. But about 20 years later, almost everyone had a TV. In 1925, the first TV is invented. In 1952, TVs are now in 12 million households. In 1969, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon as millions of people watched. In 1969, the flat screen takes over. A TV has almost a thousand channels in all in different languages, and almost every household has one. In the past, TVs only had a few channels and shows, such as Andy Griffith and Leave It to Beaver. Now, TVs are now flat and have thousands of channels and about 65 inches, and there's Netflix and Hulu. It is said that with the rise of virtual reality, that streaming TV and sitting on the couch as a family in about 50 years will be over. Here's my video. OLED TV is ushering in a new category of television. But how did we get here? After a spacewalk, an astronaut observed it is pitch black outside. Not the color black, but rather a complete absence of light. Our perspective has evolved at an incredible pace in the past 50 years. 30 years before we walked on the moon, humankind got its first look at television in the 1939 New York World's Fair. This was a revolution in technology. But the world we see is in color, not black and white. 14 years later, a color image was produced by broadcasting three monochrome images simultaneously. Of course, we did not stop here. As our viewpoint evolved, so did our quest for more detail clearer view of our world. We were on a mission to reach higher contrast ratios, superior color gamut, and more energy efficiency. As a result, the 1980s welcomed the development of plasma and liquid crystal display televisions. But LCD crystals don't produce their own light. A dedicated light source is needed, making them thicker, heavier, and unable to produce a perfect black. Then came HDTV. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for watching.